I was born and bred in East Belfast in one of those wee streets of terraced houses that was built to house the people from a shipyard. And even though I, was, I grew up in that area, I grew up with a very um, open-minded attitude and that I was never brought up to be sectarian in, in any way. And I also, from I was really young, you know, maybe eight or nine years old, I always wanted to be involved in music. Even before, I, I never could play anything when I was eight or nine years old, but I still wanted to have a band. And growing up in East Belfast, um, Irish traditional music wasn't in my radar. It wasn't something that I heard anywhere. It was totally unknown to me. But when I heard it, I understood this music. It spoke to me inside. I instinctively knew what it was and what it was about. So I always wanted to learn something, but the violin looked, you know, it was a bit hard and, and the Ellen pipes and all was very difficult and I hadn't got the puff for the whistle. So the boron was a thing that kind of intrigued me. And then I heard about um, a community relations project where they um, were putting the lambeg drum and the boron together. And I thought that would be, first of all, that the notion of putting the two things together really appealed to me from my own background. It was just something that I thought was a really good idea. But never having played either drum before, I thought I would go along to find out what it was all about. And uh, that was the, the, the beginning of different drums. Different drum started in 1992. It was the community relations project. Basically, they allow people to get up close and personal with these drums that were a symbol of, in some, no matter what side of, the, of the, the fence you come from, one of those drums is a symbol of the other side, you know, so you got a chance to come up and get near those. And since that time, they now, um, I suppose the core of, of the thing, the two founder members that are left from that very original um, lineup would have been myself and Roy Arbuckle. And then another fella, Paul Marshall. Paul's probably the newest member of, of the band. And um, he had uh, uh, built this drum from a whiskey barrel that was, uh, he'd called it a pillow drum, which means friend. Pillow apparently is the Romany word for friend. And we were talking about how good the sound is from it, and then I came up with the idea about uh, bringing, using the friendship drum to bring together people, and, and putting together a project that would bring groups of Protestants and groups of Catholics together to build one of these, and, and they play it. So we decided to use the kids from St Gabriel's and from Mount Gilbert. Um, St Gabriel's is from the, the Crumlin Road, and Mount Gilbert's up on the other side of, of the shankle. So it works in that they're both from the same kind of area of, of Belfast and they both come from both sides of the, the political divide and our idea was always if we can get these drums to play together in harmony maybe somewhere down the line the people will learn how to live together in harmony. It was one fine morning I bid New Orleans adieu and I took the road to Jackson Town my fortune to renew I cursed all foreign money no credit could I gain and I felt my heart a longing for the shores of Pontchartrain I'll raise a glass till my bonnie lands on the shores of Pontchartrain We're heading up to Bush Mills, pick up these barrels so we can get them down to Paul as quickly as we can so they can uh, prepare them for the, the workshops this weekend. And uh, it's funny these barrels because a lot of people would use them for planters, you know, they would just take them straight, cut them in half and put plants in them. But I, uh, I like the idea of making drums out of them. I like the idea of making drums out of everything. 
and you can't buy new barrels. There are no Coopers. Nobody makes barrels anymore. And it's nice because all the things that are that are about the, these drums are all unique. The best part of the world. You know, the barrels come from here. The drum was invented here, and the whole project, the whole point of this this project and this weekend, is to deal with things and the legacy of, of what has happened here over the last, depending on how far you want to go back, over the last 400 years, which ties in with Boyce Mills really nice because they started making whiskey barrels 400 years ago, you know, so it's kind of a cyclical thing. We're going to use um, Ardaloon House because Ardaloon House is a way out on its own. So when we go there, we're not going to disturb anybody by making lots of noise. And it's in Newcastle, beautiful part of the world, so it just all fitted into place. And then the idea is that on the first day when the kids get down there, we do a wee bit of work about drums, and but in a way that's a cultural aspect of drumming. So you're looking at the drums and where they come from and how they arrived here and all the drums from the different parts of the world, what they what relevance they have to their culture and how there are, there are similarities to the way we drum and our cultures here. So it's look it's putting drums in a cultural um, context if, if you want to put it like that. And also looking at the socio political history of the cultures because they have a direct relevance on the drums. And then we look at ritual and look at what ritual means um, for everybody. I mean, everybody has their own rituals, whether it's getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth and then having a cup of coffee or doing it the other way around. It's your own personal ritual that gets you out of bed in the morning, you know. So it can be something as simple as that. Or you can look at, at the big rituals, you know, like marriage, like death. You know, there's, there's, we have, we're surrounded by rituals in this country, you know. Um, you only have to look out, out the door on the 12th of July or the 15th of August they see how much ritual we have in this place. The, the barrels are made from white oak, uh, a beautiful, beautiful wood, and it's covered by, by years of just sitting in a warehouse. Um, so we have to, to basically strip the barrel down um, and finish it off and then build it back up again and then create the, the drum out of, out of, out of the, the reconditioned barrel. The first thing obviously that is done is the hoops are removed um, and the hoops are uh, generally quite rusted and in fairly poor condition. Um, they're also fixed very firmly to, to, to the barrel. They're, they're put on the barrel um, when the barrel's wet and soft and then the barrel dries and it expands and therefore it puts the barrel on under intense pressure. So whenever I'm, I'm trying to, to get the hoops off, I'm mean, going to have to use a hammer and a bolster. Once the hoop has been taken off, then um, the barrel needs to, to have the ends taken off. There is a, it's about an inch thick um, end cap on it, which, which, which again is solid oak. Uh, and I do that by using a jigsaw to drill around the, the top of the barrel. Once the top of the barrel has been taken off, um, you really get a sense of, of where the barrel has been. You get a large smell of the whiskey, which is nice. You have to be very careful because it can, be, it can go straight to your head. Um, and actually, it, it, with a lot of the barrels, you'll find that there's a lot of the residue of the actual liquor still, still in the barrel. You know, so the, the barrel has to be lifted and placed over a, a container. So, so it's a whiskey, whatever whiskey is left in it, can, can be drained from the barrel. And really, at that point, you have to leave it for half an hour, just, just to let the whiskey drain out. The next stage, once the barrel has, has been drained of, of all the whiskey inside and it has dried a little, is really to, to start dealing with, with the outside surface. Um, the barrels, when I said, when they get to, they're, they're really very, very dirty and very grubby. So uh, I, I use an angle grinder actually to, which is fairly aggressive, um, very, fairly aggressive tooling to to bring the surface down. Um, and again, the, the staves will be at different levels, you know. So and it's all uneven and it's rough and, and everything else. So I really need need, need to, to attack that with an angle grinder and to make the surface level. The the, the, the instant that you touch the drum. With the grinder, you see that the dirt disappear, and you see the beautiful white oak start start to appear. And as part of of the, of the process of, uh, of of using it for for, for distilling, um, the barrels are actually charred on the inside, and I, think, I, I believe they actually light a fire on the inside of the barrel, and it, it chars the inside. So there's a lot of black soot uh, and charcoal and kind of uh, and that kind of stuff on the inside. And again, it's another mucky job. 
um, and I, I use a wire brush on the end of a drill really to just to attack the, the inside of the of, of the barrel and and to kind of remove that 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 that, that charcoal. When I receive the barrels from the distiller, the edges are actually quite sharp, um, which if, if I were to stretch the skin over that, it would obviously cause a, a sharp edge and it could cut the skin and damage the skin and obviously ruin the drum. So one of the, 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 the most important parts of the process is really to create what's called a bearing edge. Uh, and it, it's, it involves really rounding off the edge uh, and that's grinding down the metal. So as you, you expose the wood, the metal in the wood um, and then you shape that so it's a rounded shape so they can, uh, the skin can kind of slip easily over the edge without causing damage to the skin. The hoops that are removed are, are generally quite quite rusted, they're quite in quite poor condition. Um, so before they go back onto the drum, they need to be ground down and the rust taken off, and they need to, essentially they need a, a coat of, uh, of of a paint to, to stabilise them. And then the holes are drilled um, through the hoop and then riveted onto the wood. Uh, really, the next step is really to prepare the outside of the barrel. And in the case of these ones, I just simply apply a coat of of, of a light oak stain. You know, which gives them this, this lovely brown colour, and it kind of reflects the, the original colour of. Um, of, of, of the age of the barrel and for the skin I tend to use deer skin and here is, this is one that actually that I have used to make a drum previously and these are from local red deer and uh, the heads are then soaked which allows them to be pliable um, and they're then placed over a, a stainless steel ring which is called a flesh ring and then another ring put on top it is mounted over the drum and then a hook is inserted through here which then pulls down and tightens one ring against the other nips the, the skin between the two rings and actually tensions the drum The idea for the project was that we would teach them a wee bit about drums and about the culture of drums and where drums come from and how drums weren't necessarily um, designed for music. Then what they're going to be doing is they're going to be building these drums and the idea is that it's not just one group of kids builds one drum and the other group builds another drum. We have to make them work together on it so it's, like, it's not just a Protestant drum and a Catholic drum effectively. They're, they're building the two drums together. Then we actually look at uh, playing something, learn about rhythms, learn about how rhythms work. Like stuff like where what we call Irish traditional music didn't originate in Ireland at all. Do you know like reels came from England and jigs came from Scotland and look at that in terms of the drums that we use and particularly the lamb and the boron and trying to say that you know these are just drums and whatever sounds you can get out of them is great. What we're here for this weekend we're going to do um, some stuff on drumming and all different types of drums from all over the world. I have drums here from everywhere. And then what we're going to do, we're going to get you guys to help build two drums. So one drum for each school. So you'll get a drum to take home with you, but a big drum, a big huge drum. That's made out of a whiskey barrel. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can still smell the whiskey off it. And then what we're going to do, we're going to teach us a piece of music and we're going to Try and get to the point where you can perform this at some stage with us when we play at a, at a gig somewhere. Kids always give you like a great energy, you know, they always like revitalize you when you're doing stuff like this. And I would do a lot of different um, workshops with kids and it's that they give you that great energy and that great kind of honesty. Because there are no back doors with kids, no. If they think you're talking rubbish, they'll tell you. you know? And that's really nice. This is the real thing for about the band for me. You know, a couple of weeks ago when we came back from the States, the last place we played was a 2,000 seater auditorium, sold out, that innovation, the whole works, you know, and uh, the next gig we did was in a, a wee tent in Corimila for a hundred youth workers. <laughs> and it was, people were saying, hmm, this time last week we were in Green Bay, Wisconsin, you know, in a big auditorium. This is what matters. This is, this is the real thing about different drums. And if we never did another concert, you know, on the big stage, it wouldn't bother me at all. Hey! 
people have uh, some sense that everybody knows what, what their tradition is and what their culture is and what their history is and what their instruments are. It's not true. I mean, I, I, we know we've come across children from the Catholic nationalist community that have never seen a boar on before. We're never mind a lamb big, you know. The, I mean, I suppose young people in the 80s, especially 12, 13, 14 year olds, haven't a clue about uh, traditional music. A lot of them are more interested in MTV or Britney Spears or whoever they're under, you know, or Green Day. <laughs> Sunday told us one time that we did for the Lamb Big Drum what Michael Flatley did for Irish Dancing, which was really nice. And I think that, you know, there's part of what we're, we're doing is legitimizing the drum to a certain extent and saying, look, it's all right to play this drum. It's not, it's not a thing that you should be ashamed of. But the other thing is the spirit in which you play it. You know, there's some people who you know, play Lamb Bags, they scare people, you know, and that's, you know, we don't do it like that. We play it for people they dance to, or for people they move to, or people they get enjoyment out of. Today, uh, I've been asked to build these, these two drums for you guys, okay? So, what's going to happen is we're going to build the drums, we're going to build the stands that they go on, and then you guys are going to take them home, alright? So you're going to have a drum in your school. Okay, so, this is a deer skin head, and the head on the lamb bag is made from goat, okay? And if you get a chance to, to, to go near a bit of goat skin, you find it's quite thin, you know, particularly in the lamb bag, they scrape it very thin, okay? But for these, I want something thicker, because you guys are going to be hitting them with big heavy sticks, okay? So, you just lay that on, okay? So, we use these hooks, and what happens is the hook hooks around this ring here, pulls it down, okay? Uh, and that puts tension on the head, it makes the head tighter. Okay, so now to put tension on this, basically what we need to do is the same thing as we did before. We started working around tightening these down, and that pulls down in this ring. Okay, and that's tuning. Yeah, and you got a noise. There you go. Simple as that, guys. One bit of dead gear, dead, dead deer, one barrel. Some hoops and a couple of ways, some way of string, of stretching the, the skin, and you get a drum. Myself, as, as the builder of the drum, there's a great satisfaction that comes whenever you, you put the head on the drum and you first hit the drum and you get to hear the sound of the drum for the first time. You know, This has been a whiskey barrel all its life and now it's a drum. It's the first time it's, it's, it's coming to life. It's, it's, there's a certain, a certain birth or a renaissance in that. You know, and I mean, there's nothing more satisfying for me as a, as a player and as a builder to play a drum that I made myself, to play by using sticks that I built myself and to play a, a, an improvisation or a, a rhythm that I, that's just coming from me, that's coming from the heart. And it really is, I mean, there's a special connection that comes from me to the drum. You know, and all of the energy that I've put in into the building of the drum and the hours and the days that have gone in there, I mean, they really culminate in that point. You know, so really, there, 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 is, there is a pinnacle there, um, and it's a very, very, very satisfying moment. I mean, it's 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 great drum. It's one of the things that, that that saddens me is that I have to hand them over to other people, but that's also a source of great joy because then I'm sharing I'm sharing my own energies and I'm sharing the the spirit that has gone into the drum, and I'm saying this is yours. You know, play with it, use it, enjoy it, love it. Drum circles are, are very free form things. And the idea is that you give, you put the kids in the right frame of mind, you know, so essentially you're talking to them and you're saying, well, drumming and music and living to a certain extent isn't about 
being the best or being the loudest or doing the most difficult stuff. It's about listening to everybody else and seeing what they're playing and what you can play that suits you, that makes you happy, but also works with them, you know? And it's a great metaphor for living and for, for just ordinary life. Like, So you explain that to them in a way that makes sense to them and uh, give them a drum and just let them play. And what happens nine times out of 10 is there's about five to 10 minutes of just noise where everybody just wants to make as much noise as they can and play as fast as they can and, you know, just play. And then it settles down and out of it some kind of constant rhythm will come and sometimes they'll stick on it and it'll be stuck there for 20 minutes and they're just playing the same thing over and over again. But that's alright too because that's part of that community process that's going on where you're saying, right, well this is alright, this is something that everybody likes and it's all done without words. The idea is that for St Gabriel's and Mount Gilbert that the performance isn't the end. The idea is that any time they come together that they play these drums and they play this piece. And I think the piece is very important and you're creating a new ritual for these kids. And that's really what I would like to see happen, that they a, get enjoyment out of playing it and that they feel that, that that ritual has some relevance to them. Ten years time, you'll still remember stuff that you did here. You know, it, there, there's a connection made, and it's a very strong connection. And like, if they meet up, they'll still be able to say, "Do you remember that weekend we had down in Newcastle when it rained? You know, and we made that big mad run." The hope is that other people will see this and other people will want to get involved and will want to have their own friendship drum and play that with other people. The more people that are playing friendship drums, the better. It was Plato, I think, that said that if you change the music, you can change the people.